All right. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle Cunningham. I work for the municipality of Anchorage. You know what you need to get closer to the mic. I work for the municipality of Anchorage Watershed Management Services, um, which is a uh, division of uh, uh, public uh, project management, engineering, and public works. Uh, we're, there's a lot of slashes these days in our in the title of our department. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk today. Uh, I do a lot of things at the, the city, but one of my favorite things is uh, um, administering the rain garden program. And what basically what it is, is we, uh, we've received a grant from uh, um, US Fish and Wildlife to uh, provide financial incentives in the form of cost sharing incentives to uh, residents of Anchorage, uh, and actually uh, not just residents, but uh, you know, larger corporations, groups, uh, schools, anything like that to build these things called rain gardens, which are essentially a um, type of in infiltration type of uh, device that you're going to install on your property um, in line with the, the runoff flow of water to capture as much uh, runoff from you know impervious surfaces that are on your, your property, be that a roof, a driveway, um, anything that we can capture, keep it out of the street, keep it out of the storm drain system and going into the creeks. And I always say the number one public message that I try to uh, say when I when I give these type of presentations and that most people don't understand is that uh, the the drains that we see on our streets in our city storm storm system go directly to all of our creeks and to the inlet. There's not really much in the way of water treatment. Uh, a lot of people think that the uh, that the water that goes down the storm drains goes to the sewage treatment plant, the same place that the drains and your toilets and your uh, in your property go. And that's just not true. There's uh, you're lucky if there's if the the system, the storm drain system, has an oil and grit separated at the downstream end to kind of clean out the the, the sinkers and the floaters, to so to say, at the, at the downstream end of the uh, um, of the system. Uh, so not much uh, in the way of treatment of our uh, of our public uh, um, stormwater runoff so that's why we are doing these type of things a um, couple things we're going to talk about we're going to talk about why we need rain gardens uh, how you're going to build a rain garden and then briefly about uh, a little bit about the cost sharing incentive the program that we offer um, which we have much more information on on our website anchoragerangardens.com and there's also a lot of materials here on the table uh, right in the middle uh, go ahead and grab some brochures uh, and uh, um, big reason why we want to do this is uh, as our city grows, we are uh, increasingly uh, paving over uh, natural vegetation and uh, basically increasing the uh, amount of imper what we call impervious services in the in the city areas that uh, are prone to runoff, areas that will not intake or uptake water, not allow water to infiltrate when uh, when water hits that surface. They will rather run off and go someplace else. Uh, and this kind of gives you this uh, figure gives you an idea of uh, conditions under pre and post development. You see, you get about half of the um, groundwater recharge uh, under post development conditions. And the big one here is the surface water runoff it goes from about a third of a percent uh, under pre developed conditions to 30 percent under uh, post development conditions. I mean, this is a this is a general graphic. It's not really talking about how much uh, impervious surface or development, but uh, you kind of get the idea there. Um, here's another uh, good uh, example that shows uh, we're looking at the uh, red line showing a this is what we would call a hydrograph it's a, 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 a graph showing um, after a duration after a, ro a, a rain event the powerful you know the, the amount of flow that you get uh, so long after a rain event and uh, what you're seeing here is the red would be a, a figure for a seven percent impervious uh, surface the blue would be 36 percent impervious surface so more of a developed uh, community um, actually we're, we're usually most places in Anchorage are even higher density than 36 percent but you can see that the what you get on the blue line graph is a lot of spikes you get a lot a lot more spikes and you get a lot higher spikes meaning your flow is going to be higher leaving uh, uh, and when you get higher flow velocities uh, you get more things like scour um, erosion that type of thing that's going to allow uh, more sediment and other type of pollutants that may be at, uh, attached to that sediment to be mobilized into the storm stormwater system as uh, I always like these pictures uh, this is a good example of Anchorage before and 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 now uh, Anchorage in 1950. We're at, right now we're looking at an aerial photo of Middle Fork Chester Creek, um, actually North Fork Chester Creek, I believe. Um, uh, right below uh, the Merrill Field, 
uh, airport, and you can see the, the layer of green is the area of wetland uh, that we had in 1950, and you see you, all the gray is basically your impervious surfaces, your streets, your sidewalks, your roofs. So you just get an idea of changes, you know, that have that have happened, and the reason why we are uh, more concerned these days about uh, stormwater runoff and, and trying to control it as much as possible. Another example from uh, uh, Diamond Boulevard area, Campbell Lake. Even before Campbell Lake was a lake, um, uh, where it was a stream there, but you really see a, t a lot more. Uh, wetland area and a lot less development uh, 50 years ago or 65 years ago now um, so um, it's just a brief graphic showing uh, the difference between what we have in our city is it what's called an ms4 or a municipal separate storm sewer system i believe that's all the s's may have added one in there but uh, um, it's different. Uh, a lot of uh, newer cities, uh, smaller cities, usually have this type of thing. It's different from a larger, older city that would have those big kind of vaults, uh, combined sewer system where they're sending all of their stormwater and all of their uh, wastewater to a to a treatment plant or something like that. Where we have a completely separate system, as I mentioned before. Um, common stormwater pollutants, we you know trash, cigarette butts, lots of. Uh, but the main one that we're concerned about is we have petroleum products, you know, any, anything you can think of is, gets into storm, uh, storm water. Anything that gets on the road surface, sidewalks, gets into storm water as soon as it starts raining. So um, the main one we are concerned about, though, with, uh, as mentioned in the trivia, is sediment. And the main reason for that is we get, uh, uh, we have good uh, salmon streams in the, in the city of Anchorage, and salmon need a, uh, um, a gravel bed in order to lay their, they lay their eggs. And as you add fine grain sediment to that situation, it kind of can sediment up the, uh, it can, yeah, you can fill in the, the gaps of all the, the, the nice gravel beds, and it becomes less of a, uh, a good habitat for salmon. And also with uh, sediment is you get a lot of uh, things like fecal coliform, other organic, uh, pollutants, uh, oils, lots of things that can uh, bond electronically to, uh, to sediment particles. And so when you mobilize sediment, you're not just mobilizing sediment, you're mobilizing a lot of the other stuff that we don't want in stormwater and taking that out to the stream the same way. Uh, just a idea of uh, what what's different between a you know a kind of more natural situation as to a developed situation you're getting a lot more runoff from and your sources of runoff in a city situation is going to be from your roof your driveway your street surfaces sidewalks and uh, believe it or not from your lawn surfaces as well a lot of people think that lawns would act similar to a vegetated surface a naturally vegetated surface and it is true that they do uh, infiltrate water to a certain degree, but we find that they're more of a runoff producer than they are of a uh, infiltrating surface. They actually um, run off a lot more than you would expect, and as you, especially if you have a sloping lawn, as most people do, and the front lawns kind of slope down to the street, you're going to see a lot more of that water, especially under a larger uh, rain event, uh, running off into the street than actually soaking into the, the lawn surface itself. So just because you have a light, nice lawn grass strip in front of your house, it doesn't mean that you are, it means that you may, you probably are still uh, contributing to the stormwater problem and uh, when, when water collects on your roof and runs off through your gutters and, and makes it all the way to the street. So the reason why we need rain gardens, we have more pavement, more uh, impervious surfaces than we ever did before, less natural vegetation, uh, more runoff, more flooding, uh, requires more municipal storm drain maintenance, you have to clean out our catch basins more often to get all that sediment out of there, it collects a lot quicker. Um, habitat, habitat degradation and a fun functional ecosystem, especially for the salmon that we all love in our city. So now a little bit on how to build a rain garden, and the first thing that you want to think about I guess I should t start with a, a little bit more about the general concept of a rain garden and what we're trying to do with rain garden and uh, rain gardens is to intercept runoff from your roof, like I said before, and and put it, it direct it to a place where we're going to allow that uh, that runoff water to accumulate naturally and allow it time and pore space beneath the ground to infiltrate at a rate that it, uh, that that it can and uh, not run off 
further down into the system, get into the storm drain type of system. So what you're basically doing is you're going to be modifying, you're going to dig out uh, the, the existing native soil in your rain garden area and modify the soil by putting in more sand mixture. It's usually a 60% sand to 40% topsoil. Actually, it's better to have 40% kind of organic uh, soil mixture. Um, so, but the, the key there is the 60% sand mixture. Adding more sand to the soil provides a lot more. The way sand is kind of a um, larger grain size than typical a lot of our typical um, soils here, which is a mixture of sand, uh, silt, clay. So um, when you add all that sand in there, you're getting a lot more pore space, allowing a lot more area in the in the soil under the area under the garden for uh, water to accumulate. Do you have a question? Um, you, you, typically, you're going to want to exca excavate out uh, 24 to 30 inches. Uh, it, a lot depends. I always encourage people, and I'll get into this as we build, uh, as we get a little more specific on the building of the garden. Um, I always encourage people to do what's called an infiltration test on their lawn before, or in the area that the garden would be before they start planting the garden. Because if you know the, the natural infiltration rate of the area that you're going to put the garden, then it kind of gives you an idea of, uh, you know, how deep and how big you, you're going to need to go with the garden. It's kind of it's, there's there's several pieces to to the puzzle of figuring out where you know how big to build the garden, how deep to go. But as far as uh, knowing how how fast your native soils are going to infiltrate to begin with uh, is going to be a, a good idea. That's going to be a good idea so that you know how how deep to go and if you might want to modify your lower layers by adding like an extra layer of gravel, some other things that we're going to talk about in a second here. So first things that you need to do is you need to find a spot that's going to be easy to intercept your runoff. And usually all your runoff, the, the easily inter intercepted runoff is going to be from your roof because typically people have rain gutters that go to one or two downspouts. So your, the majority of your roof runoff water is going to be go directed to one spot or to maybe two spots on your property where that's going to run off the, uh, um, the property. So. It's best to, if you can choose a, a location that is going to be uh, near and down gradient from your your uh, your gutters, because you need water needs to flow by means of gravity. You don't want to have to install some sort of pump to get your your rainwater into your garden. So you're going to have it down gradient of it. You want to provide a little bit of a pooling surface. The gar the the garden itself is going to be either slightly concave or if it's in a sloped area is going to have a berm on the downhill end to provide a pooling area of six to eight inches to allow that water if you have a larger event and you're getting a large flush of uh, um, runoff all at the same time you're going to allow that water to kind of accumulate and pool up and then infiltrate slowly as as it needs to we don't want that water to pond up for more than a day or two we don't want more mos encourage more mosquito growth that type of thing and typically your plants aren't going to be well uh, suited for being inundated with water for more than a couple of days anyway so it's a good idea to that's why another reason to do the infiltration test and really try to get the uh, calculations uh, done properly to know how deep to go and if you need to modify some of your base layers so oh and the fourth component is we want to choose native vegetation and if native vegetation hardy uh, water loving plants perennials native vegetation is usually the best for that because native vegetation is already suited for the type of environment you're going to put it in and uh, especially if you choose some of the you know more water loving species and um, I actually have some handouts and on our website there's a, there's a list of uh, suggested plants that we would uh, suggest for putting in your rain garden. Anything from plants or from uh, wildflowers to nice shrubs. Um, the only thing that really doesn't well, do well in a garden, it's rain garden itself, would be trees. Uh, although that doesn't mean that you can't incorporate a rain garden into an overall landscaping plan if you're trying to plan for your back, uh, you know, your backyard or something like that and incorporate trees into maybe a higher area near the rain garden or along the fringe of the rain garden but you just wouldn't want the roots of those trees in your you know wetted surface of your rain garden you're going to want to use the natural slope of your land if, if if at all possible some people will modify and dig down little trenches or so i've even seen some people uh put a piece of conduit all the way under their lawn and sod back over the top of it so you wouldn't even know that there's a conveyance from the downspout into the garden itself so here you see a rock line trench. They've actually used the layer of gravel at the base to give a little more uh, capacity underneath the garden. It doesn't look like this one may have been excavated out or perhaps it's backfilled with that much gravel. 
But um, other things to consider is we usually try to, you know, you can put the garden wherever you want, but we usually recommend that you keep it 10 feet away from any building. Um, you don't want to encourage too much more infiltration of water right next to your foundation. It's usually not a good idea. Uh, likewise, avoid your septic, avoid steep slopes. It's hard to build a big enough berm, and if, once you get too much of a berm on a very steep slope, um, you're creating a deeper pond as well, which may not be good. It's not good for your your plants to be completely underwater. They can they can deal with having a few inches, which is why we recommend the six to eight inches of ponding depth for a typical garden. Um, tree buffer is a good idea. We say rule of thumb: stay one foot uh, for every inch uh, inch diameter of the tree at breast height, which is usually how they measure a tree. You want to stay about a foot away from the base of that tree from your garden for every inch of diameter of the tree. Um, avoid rights of way, although we have had good luck with people building uh, gardens in uh, municipal rights of way, I always say make sure you contact the right of way department and uh, that they know what your project is going to be and that's not an area where they side cast snow necessarily when they plow stuff or it's not an area that they used for some sort of maintenance or if it's an easement area that maybe need to be dug up in case there's utilities, something like that. So. You just get all the, you know, the normal assurances that you would from the, you know, the utilities and the right of way department if you want to, uh, um, this, the normal stuff you would do before you dig a big hole anyway, so. Uh, besides the infiltration capacity of the existing uh, land that you're installing the rain garden in, the, the, probably the biggest thing in determining how big to build your garden is the size of your contributing area. Like we said, with the the typical contributing area for a residential rain garden is going to be your roof. So you're going to calculate the surface area of your roof. And the general rule of thumb, there's the um, our rain gardens manual on our website goes into a more depth and the, the calculations that you can do to really get your the size of your garden and the depth of your garden locked down. But if you just want to do it more, you know, by feel. A typical, uh, we typically say that the rain garden surface area size, we're talking about the, the footprint of the rain garden here, is going to be 5 to 10 percent of the size of your contributing area. The area that's going to run off into the garden is going to be typically, yeah, the, the garden size typically 5 to 10 percent of that. Usually if you do a 10 percent size garden, unless you already, you know you have poorly infiltrating soils to begin with, you're probably going to be good with a 10 percent garden. That's usually a little oversized for most of our uh, types of storms that you would even be able to capture all of the runoff from a larger storm event that you know a, 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 a you know a longer return interval type storm event this just gives you an idea of different ways you can uh, and this is in the uh, one of our brochures here on the table gives you an idea of there's you can get creative with uh, getting the surface area that you need you know you don't need to have a round guard you don't need to have a square garden if you only have a small area to, to work with you know, and you need to get 40 square feet out of, out of a garden. You could do a two foot wide garden by 20 foot garden and you could make it an L shape so you could, you know, buffer the outside of your yard and make a perimeter type garden. Um, it's all about the excavation that you're doing, the modifying the soils, providing that storage area on the surface. So get creative with your, uh, and that's why we say, you know, whatever the shape and the alignment is whatever works best for your yard. So get creative with getting that surface area out of the, you know, the, the different alignments that you can do to get the surface area that you need. Um, check your soils ahead of time. Um, on the left we have what would be a very, considered very sandy soil. You would clump it together and it wouldn't want to stay in a clump. It would start to break up uh, in your hand. That's going to be a good well-draining soil. Uh, typically more of our soils here are a little more on this side of what you see on the right there, which would be a more silty, clay soil, where you're going to, when you pump it in your hand, it's going to stay in a clump. And if you're getting into this really clay soils, where you can even kind of, you know, extrude a little ribbon of clay and have it stand up out of your out of your hand, then you know you've got this clay soils. And we're going to have to talk a little bit more about maybe oversizing the garden or excavating deeper and putting in that layer of gravel or something to provide a little extra pore space down there. So. Um, so, do an infiltration test on your lawn. We always recommend this. This is kind of a rudimentary way of doing it. You're going to dig a, you know, one foot by one foot by one foot pit, fill it up with water, and then measure it every hour, every half hour, and see how, how quickly the water drops. There, there's, a, you know, a more standard engineered way to do this as well. And that, uh, 
that process is, is laid out in our uh, Rain Garden manual as well on, on that you can find on our website. So if you're interested in doing a more, you know, kind of scientific infiltration rate test, uh, go ahead and check out our Rain Garden manual and that will step you through that part of the process. And typically we say, you know, anything, anything that's going to be infiltrating at more than a half an inch an hour is going to be pretty good and well suited for a rain garden. You're going to be able to do the typical rain garden profile. You probably won't have to do too much uh, modification. If it's much less than half an inch an hour, then we're going to have to talk about some modifications possibly. This is probably the most important slide here. This is your, your vertical profile of your finished rain garden. And what you've got here is You've got your, you're shown here, and this, ignore, ignore these bottom two layers to begin with here. What the, your typical rain garden profile would start here. We're showing a, you know, our two to three feet of an amended soil mix, which is going to be your 60% uh, sand to 40% topsoil or 40% of some type of organic soil mixture. Um, it's a good idea to have a couple inches of mulch on top of that to kind of hold, hold your plants in, especially after you've planted them, and especially because you, you're going to get a few flushes of water through there when water runs off. Having the mulch in there, especially newly planted plants, is going to help your plants establish themselves a little bit better, get rooted a little bit better, and, and keep them from getting washed out in case you have a big, you know, a big fully washer type of rain event where you might wash out all your new, newly planted stuff. So. Here you're showing the, the slope of the direction that you're getting your runoff to, so you've got to have an area, this is like the kind of showing that you need to have your rain garden in an area that's easy to direct your runoff to, um, and you're going to have a berm on the down slope, and, which is what's going to stop your water, slow it down, and allow it to infiltrate in and drop all of its sediment load and potential pollutant load. And uh, so there's where you get your 6 to 8 inches of ponding depth. Um, here, these bottom two layers are what we would talk about as the modifications. You can add layers of, you know, additional layers of sand or even gravel. And the larger, the larger size gravel you're going to get, obviously, the way that that's going to lay in the hole is going to provide more pore space, more more area for the water to kind of reside while it diffuses naturally through the the native the vegetation. And you may think, we've been talking about a lot of runoff from your property, from your roof, and you may think, well, you know, the water from my roof, that's, that's fairly clean, you know, you're not going to, you, you're not, there's what pollutants are in the roof runoff, and you're right, there's not a whole lot of pollutants, you know, from your shingles and that's running off the roof, but what we're, what the, the bigger uh, concern and the reason why we're doing this is, it's the, the pollutants and the sediment that exist in the street, and, and keeping keeping more of that runoff water out of the storm drain system, out of the street, and it, you know, if you can keep all the water that runs off your property on your property, infiltrating on your property, it keeps it out of the street and less available to scour pollutants and dirt out of the street itself and carry that to the crease. So it's not really about, you know, intercepting the pollutants from your property, although it could be good for intercepting uh, fertilizers and other type of organic pollutants and stuff like that, but, um, it's really more about keeping runoff water out of the system itself and out of the storm drain system. So next thing, you've, you've, you've dug your hole, you've uh, backfilled it with your, your rain garden mixture. Oh, and by the way, if you're interested in doing a rain garden, there's a list of trained contractors, um, landscapers that know uh, what they're doing to, that, yeah, that can help you with the process and a lot of uh, Places like uh, Alaska Mill and Feed has will if you go in and say I'm I'm looking to plant my rain garden they're going to know what you're talking about and will be able to direct you to uh, types of you know plants that would work well for your garden and places like uh, Alaska Sand and Gravel have mixed up a spec of what they call I believe they just call it the rain garden mixture if you go in there asking them for the soil that's going to be pre mixed 60 percent. Um, I know it's 60% sand. I'm not sure if it's all topsoil is the other 40% or if it's a topsoil uh, um, organic mixture, but uh, you, you know you've got the 60% sand in there, and that's going to be the important component of your, your rain garden soil itself. Um, so next step, you're going to choose your plants. Um, you're going to want, uh, if at all possible, native plants. You don't want anything, definitely nothing that's going to be considered an invasive species. Um, native plants are best because they're already suited for the environment, uh, can handle the, um, being saturated with water for periods of time. 
um, uh, tend to uh, root well and uh, will be less prone to erosion and scour. Um, they're low maintenance perennials, you won't have to replant them. They're gonna fill in their garden eventually um, by themselves. You can start by planting little clumps and they're gonna you know, kind of propagate themselves over uh, a couple of years. And typically you find that uh, the third growing season of, of a rain garden is when it really kind of explodes with growth and where you really get that, uh, you know, all the species kind of filling in the extra spaces. So. And we do have, a reminder, we do have a lot of, you know, beautiful Alaska wildflowers that, that look great in gardens too. And so don't feel like, not, not that you can't plant uh, non-native species, you, you definitely can. So don't feel like this is, you know, it's your garden, you can plant uh, pretty much anything you want. We don't typically recommend vegetables because you are directing your runoff water into it and whatever pollutants may already be in that. It's not necessarily a good idea for vegetables. But, uh, um, any type of flowers, bushes, anything like that, as long as it's well suited for uh, for being partially saturated with water. And you may even, and especially this year is a good example of it. You're going, you may even need to water your rain garden if you're not getting a lot of rain. You know, make sure your garden's happy. Make sure, especially after you've planted it, that those those plants are going to get what they need to grow properly. So, I want to skip through here to a couple of good picture examples of things that we've done here. Um, this is an example here of the Taku Lake Rain Garden. Um, Taku Lake Park is located uh, uh, north of Diamond off King Street, kind of back in a little in, in industrial subdivision. And uh, what you're seeing here in the picture on the right is uh, where those bollards are. There is a probably a good 40 car uh, stall um, parking lot, impervious surface paved parking lot. And what used to happen was when that when it would rain, all that runoff water and any type of sediment and motor oil, anything that's in that parking lot would run off right through this gully, underneath that bridge and into the lake. So carrying any type of pollutants that may be in that sediment with it. And so what was done back in 2007 was they excavated out, built the rain garden here, planted it, and now, now you see it, it's completely taken over. It's, it looks like a really nice garden. The irises have really propagated themselves nicely and um, I at least have not heard of an instance where we've had a rain event that has overtopped the garden itself. I believe that the majority of the rain events uh, are infiltrating in the garden and so no runoff water is actually escaping into the lake anymore. Um, went over all this stuff already. So a little bit about the program. Um, through the grant that we get through Fish and Wildlife, we're able to offer a uh, up to half of your costs um, reimbursed uh, up to $750. So, and that covers everything uh, besides buying, or buying tools and uh, putting actual rain gutters on your house. But it does cover things like equipment rental. A lot of people find that it's easiest if they uh, you know, rent a uh, you know a backhoe or a bobcat for for the afternoon to dig the hole because that's probably the most labor intensive part. But uh, it even goes so far as to cover professional landscaping services if you just wanted to hire somebody to build the whole garden for you. There's plenty of people out there that will do that. Those typically tend to be a little more expensive. Uh, the previous rain garden uh, programmer did a little research on this, and she found that. Uh, um, if you do it your, yourself, the typical cost is about three to five dollars per square foot. To have somebody else to do it, it can get up to ten to fifteen dollars per square foot of rain garden to to install. So, and for the commercial gardens, the the larger gardens, um, that reimbursement can can go all the way up to five thousand dollars. But that is reimbursed at half your cost, and, but it's based on the overall square footage of the area that you're your contributing area, your impervious surface that you're that you are directing to the garden. So you would get 50 cents per square footage, square foot that you are directing into the garden. So that's, that's how you, so if, theoretically if you, if you had a $10,000 project that had, that was uh, draining a 10,000 square foot area, you could get the full $5,000 reimbursement for a commercial project. A uh, list of trained landscapers, uh, contractors that, uh, that know what they're doing with this. Uh, uh, the list is also on our website. Um, AnchorDrainGardens.com, and you can get a good idea of, uh, um, yeah, if you would like to hire somebody to do that. I think it's just that's just about everything that I have. Here's another really good example. This was a really nice do-it-yourself. The area before the garden was built, the garden right after it was planted, and then year three, that's what the garden looks like. And and just this is a good example also of what I was talking about of incorporating a rain garden into 
an overall landscaping feature. This whole thing is not really the rain garden. Really the rain garden is this strip that is wrapping around the garden here, around these kind of raised beds. That was the area that was infiltrated out. So they have incorporated the rain garden area into an overall landscaping feature. And it's grown in really nicely after three years. Another example here, and this is not, he is, this, I, I, people always ask when they see this, uh, this picture, that why is this full of water? I thought they weren't supposed to be, you know, ponded for, for that much time. Well, he, he's actually testing the infiltration rate of his finished garden. He had flooded that garden to see how fast the water would, would, would go down there. So, and here's a picture of year three of his garden. So that's about half an hour. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, if you would like any more information on the program, uh, I encourage you, I have some business cards in the uh, um, little pamphlet uh, holder there and uh, take some of the brochures. Um, contact me, we offer free site visits for helping you plan your garden. We'll come out and take a look at your, uh, um, your lawn, your area where you're thinking about building a garden and uh, kind of step you through the process of uh, what you should do, uh, how to start planning. Um, we're not gonna plan the whole garden for you, but we'll provide any type of uh, assistance that you may need along the way. And, you know, people call me several times and say, hey, you know, I've gotten to this step and I'm, I've gotten this to, to this roadblock, what should I do? I'm happy to give advice throughout the process. So just get in touch with me if you're interested. And, uh, oh, another thing I should mention is right now, our grant from Fish and Wildlife is set to end at the end of this year. So we have plenty of money to incentivize all the gardens that could be built in Anchorage this year, but funding in the future at this point is a little up in the air. We're, we're gonna be looking for new funding sources. Not sure if that same grant is available for Fish and Wildlife at this point. So if you're thinking about building a garden, I would definitely encourage you to get it done this year. Because any reimbursements that are submitted before the end of December this year, we'll have money to reimburse. So. Um, Get in touch with me, fill out an application, and uh, we'll get started. Uh, questions? Do you do any of the digging? No, I'm not going to do any of the digging for you. I'm sorry. I can't, I can't do that. I got, I got plenty of gardening to do in my own yard. Um, yes? You mentioned scour several times. I yes. Don't know what that is. Scour is uh, basically when you, uh, typically when, when sediment is deposited um, and dries out, it's going to be kind of cemented into an area, and so it takes, especially based on the, the size of grain, um, the, the smaller grain size of sediment, the, the more cemented in it gets and the harder it is for that sediment to become mobilized again through you know, air transport, wind transport, or water transport. And scour is typically a term we use for water transport when you've got a velocity of water that is high enough to start mobilizing some of those particles and, and, and eroding away the, uh, the kind of sedimented in particles that are existing there. For instance, paving roadways or something? Yes, and, and typically very t in our roadways, you can see really caked in thick, fine-grained uh, sediment that even after the sweepers have gone through sometimes, they're still leaving a really, you know, almost, it feels as hard as concrete sometimes, but that's just a really sedimented in, really fine grain because of the, the sand that we put on our road and then the milling from car tires can really break that, uh, that sand down into really fine grain and, and sediment that stuff into the, the areas where we don't have as much traffic or water transport, so. Yes? How did the program get started? Um, it's a few years before my time, but you know, I'm not entirely sure. Mel, do you know how the program was started initially? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it was started a few years before I actually got involved with the city, and uh, but I, yeah, I think that 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 sounds correct. That they, Fish and Wildlife had this this money. I think it was originally as part of a Salmon in the City initiative to promote uh, cleaner water for um, cities that have salmon spawning streams and stuff like that. Yes, sir. It's not a new concept. I heard about it in South Carolina more than nine years ago. Huh? No, and there's actually a lot of uh, um, communities and uh, that have embraced this more than the Anchorage area. This is Anchorage area. Um, our program would kind of be more of a, a grassroots type of program because it's really incumbent on uh, residents and citizens to build their own projects. But uh, places like Seattle and King County and Washington have really embraced uh, the type of uh, you know infiltration as a principle itself and incorporating rain gardens into kind of their sidewalks and their street runoff to, you know, actually incorporating that into the city planning of, uh, 
you know, new de new development and stuff like that. So yeah, it has been around for a long time, and uh, there are definitely places that are more on top of things than we are. I don't think I should answer that question. I don't, I don't know if it's, uh, um, if it's a native area that you own, uh, knock yourself out. But I would not encourage you to go into your neighbor's yard or any, into any parkland or anything like that. So uh, I'm going to defer that question. Yes, ma'am. You know, it is up to you. Uh, I mean, you're potentially, and like I said, you, you, typical runoff surface to your rain garden is going to be your roof. You're not going to have a whole lot of, you know, bad chemicals. I'm not. I haven't done the research to find out what type of chemicals you may be coming off of. You know, different type of roof surfaces. Like I can imagine asphalt shingles, which are typically used a lot up here, break down to a certain degree, and there's probably some harmful stuff in that. But I just haven't done the research to to know what exactly is in that. So. Not something I would recommend, but it could be something that you, you could explore. Uh, but even something that grows on top of the ground is going to be getting its nutrients from its roots in the ground. So anything that may be getting into there may still be uptaking any uh, um, pollutants that may be in that water. So, Yes, in the back. That's a good question. I don't know if it's uh, something that we've looked at um, uh, too closely, so I don't know if I can answer that. Uh, but you know, it is a garden that's going to get regular watering if we're getting regular rain. So, uh, and it's, I guess the, the important thing is it's a, it's, it can be a more hands-off type of garden. It's something that's going to take care of itself, especially if you plant a hardy native species that uh, will come back, especially the perennials that'll come back year after year. So if you do, you do all that and it's getting its regular water, we, we find that they do grow really well. And native, native uh, gardens here do great anyway. So. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're good growing gardens. I don't know if they're going to grow faster than a traditional garden necessarily, but uh, we know that they grow in all sorts of conditions and through all sorts of summer type, type of conditions that we can have up here. So, yes, sir. Yeah, this program is designed for the homeowner to fix a problem. Why doesn't the municipality address this with, uh, instead of, I mean, now it's designed that you want to drain your property. And that's, that's how it is. Seem like there ought to be something, some kind of legislation or some kind of movement to fix it before the landlord doesn't have to fix it all the time. Yeah, um, there's. The typical uh, runoff situation in the city is going to be runoff from uh, surrounding areas around you, your neighbors' lawns. Uh, natural surfaces above you. Um, there's not a whole lot of situations where we have, you know, street surfaces running off onto your property. Um, but in those kind of situations, it's, uh, yeah, it's in the city's interest to have things like curbs and gutters to keep that water from entering your property because the city doesn't want to have any um, city storm water from, you know, city streets, city rights away. We don't want to have any uh, you know, bad effects on the, the homeowners and that type of thing. But it, it becomes a muddy issue because, it, because it, is, it is typically a civil issue between neighbors as far as, you know, he is directing water onto my property and stuff like that. So it's hard for the city to kind of wade into those type of things. And as far as the legislation goes, it's, it goes a little bit above my pay grade. And, uh, uh, yeah, talk to your assembly m member and the mayor, I guess. and get it. But getting money to pay for anything these days in the city is, uh, is a pretty big consideration. So... Yes, ma'am. A couple of questions. Um, so far, you've been talking about landed owners. Do corporations or businesses, is there also this right now? Yes, if you're going to be, if you have a an area that uh, conveys water to the storm drain system from a parking lot or something like that, and you have some adjacent landscaping where you would be able to potentially direct that water to and excavate out to have, you know, to get the full profile of the rain garden, um, then yeah, you can, the a corporation could, or a school or something like that could qualify up to a $5,000 reimbursement. But like I said before, that's based on a per square foot uh, of contributing area to the garden. So it's a reimbursed at a rate of 50 cents per square foot of the contributing area, up and to $5,000. And then you showed the difference between a do-it-yourself project cost versus having someone else do it. Yes. Um, so it's cheaper to do it yourself, but if I have no skill set or knowledge on how to do that and not agree with them, mm -hmm. you'll help, 
but like the picture you showed was really pretty, and I wouldn't know how to change my yard that looks like your pre-picture to that post-picture without what I think is more than a little help. So start I, with you and see. I would say start with downloading the Rain Garden Manual on the website. It's a it's a good. I think it's almost thirty page document that that talks you through step by step how to plan a rain garden. I would read through that first and then kind of formulate your, what questions you have left because I think you'll find that a lot of your a lot of the typical questions and especially people that don't you know that it sounds completely foreign to them um, it will answer a lot of your questions. It may be a little uh, a little more technical than you would even like so you know formulate your questions from that and then I would say come to me with those questions and um, with some ideas in mind for your yard of what you might like to do, because it's always a good idea if you want to have a site visit, if you have some ideas in mind of what you would like to do, then that's a good starting point for when I come and take a look at things and say, well, this may be more feasible than what you had planned, but we can try to make this work, you know, to the best that we can. And, and you know, if it's, if you just throw your hands up in the air after all that and decide that you want to hire somebody to do it, there are plenty of great uh, landscapers in town that have built, uh, you know, dozens of these at this point. Green Earth uh, Landworks, I think, is up into the dozens at this point. So. Uh. And finally, a lot of your discussion was about rain runoff, mm -hmm. which to me means rain that comes down and then floods. Yep. If you already have an area that has uh, an unwanted pond or swamp collecting, is that probably runoff that's just runoff that's collected? Yeah, it's probably runoff that's collected, unless it's a especially wet year. It's possible that you could get the groundwater table to rise so much that you would have water coming up from the ground. That's not very typical, or interflow water that could come up to the surface. Not very typical unless it's a very extreme year or an extreme type of uh, time of the season, you know, during during breakup, um, during the fall when we get a ton of uh, large rain events, that type of thing. So this is the solution for that also? It's not necessarily the, the solution. It can be a solution. It may not be the solution. Um, Typically, if you have an area that ponds up and that pond stays all summer, like I'll go to some sites where somebody says, I've got this pond in my backyard and it stays till mid-July. Well, that immediately means to me that you've got some really poorly draining soils under there. You've probably got a lot of underlaying clay layers and it may not even be feasible to do a rain garden. You can't put a rain garden in every soil situation in this town. So. But there may be, you can do some calculations, you can oversize it, you can do a lot of things to try to alleviate it. And I mean, if you've got a lot of clays, clay layers uh, underneath you, it, excavating that out and backfilling it with sand and gravel is just going to provide more storage space underground anyway. So at the very least, your pond's going to be smaller the next time it fills up. So you may still pond on the surface and having it that much of a pond, you may, you know, drown out your plants, but it may help solve the problem, if not solve the problem completely. Yes? You know, when I think about my neighborhood, um, you know, there might be, it's a reasonably flat neighborhood, so there aren't big, curved hills from the houses and stuff like that. So I would imagine that the runoff from the lawns is minimal, but man, there are some big driveways. Isn't there, it seems like that would be a huge part of um, is there any way to retrofit a driveway? It's, it, it can be done, it can be a little difficult. If, if you're having a garden, or if you're having a driveway redone, you could definitely talk to the person that's installing it about potentially crowning it to one side, and you could install maybe a strip garden, rain garden along that side that the, that the water's gonna go to. Um, it's not something that's gonna be done unless you actually talk to the person that's uh, building your, uh, your driveway because I think typically a driveway is going to be slightly crowned in the middle so it's going to run off both sides and then sloped down to the street so it's going to run off to the street so since that's typically the way that they're built it's really hard to intercept that water because the water is coming down directly to the street and there is no kind of vegetated area in between there for you to install that garden but if you had a new one uh, being installed you could uh, look at putting you know kind of a you could swale one area so that water would collect and run off to a certain area. You could crown it to one side. There's there's some things you could do, but there, you would probably need to do some modifications to your driveway to get that to work. Could you could you insert a you know 
know, like a, a mosaic of bricks or something like that? So you have some absorbent surface? There is a, there is a product called, uh, they call it permeable pavers. There's, I think there's quite a few products for them, but they're, uh, they're kind of like, uh, Kind of like a brick alignment that will will allow for water to uh, infiltrate in between or actually through the the media of, of the, the the paver itself, and um, so there there are things to explore there. It hasn't been used a ton up here so far. People, I think, uh, because of our cold wa cold weather climate, uh, a lot of times uh, developers are hesitant to use kind of newer uh, techniques, especially low impact development techniques because you know the the go-to answer is oh it's not going to work up here because it's too cold and uh there's not a ton of research that's been done as so far as to what what happens to those permeable pavers under ice all winter and especially the big concern i think is the the, win the wintertime sanding that we do especially in our parking lots that uh you know the pavers are going to have a capacity before they're going to get filled up with fine grain sediment as well so if you're going to fill up all your pore space in your pavers with, you know, a winter's worth of sand, it may not be the best idea because you may have to reinstall it or, or do some maintenance on it each year. So it's something that has been done and it has been done in the, in the city itself, but uh, I don't think there's a lot of feedback yet because I think all those projects are fairly new within the last couple of years at least, at least the ones I'm aware of. Yes, sir? DuPonts? DuPonts? Um, a role in in what respect? Yes, ponds ponds are. I mean, uh, I would say an, a storm drain outfall to a pond is better than a storm drain outfall to a stream because what again what mobilizes sediment and what mobilizes pollutants is an increase in. Um, in the velocity of the water that is flowing over it. So if you dump a bunch of, you know, pollutant heavier, sediment heavy water into a pond where the velocity is going to drop down to nearly zero or zero, you're going to have a lot more time for that for that water to drop its load out in the pond rather than transporting it further down in the system or sedimenting into uh, stream systems. But we would like to keep even all of that sediment out of ponds themselves. But yeah, we do, I mean, we build engineered ponds, uh, sedimentation basins uh, into some of our storm drain designs to, for that very purpose of uh, allowing the sediment to accumulate before it gets into the, into the creek. Um, but eventually those things have to be maintained, um, dug out, dredged out, that type of thing, so. Yes? Yeah, you talked a lot about sediment in the street. Where I live, 90% of my roof and the lawn drains right into Campbell Creek. Mm -hmm. Is there much sediment out of the lawn? Do I need to do something for that? Or May is it just 10% you know, the sediment's probably not, a, the main sediment source is the streets and the sidewalks, so your your concern wouldn't be necessarily sediment, but you may be um, transporting a lot, I mean, if you use fertilizers on your lawn, uh, um, that's an organic pollutant that can be really bad for streams, cause eutrophication of streams, you know, unbridled algae growth, that type of thing that can choke out some of the um, um, other species that live in the, uh, in the streams themselves. So there are other types of, you know, pollutants that come off from runoff from lawns and uh, you know your your surfaces of your house and stuff like that but uh, so sediment wouldn't be as big a concern in your type of situation so if you didn't add anything would you recommend a garden or not um, it, I mean it depends on how I guess in that situation I would say it depends on how much fertilizer you use on your lawn if you're if you're not concerned about the fertilizer transport I wouldn't be too concerned about too much other pollutants coming off of your lawn. Another concern though from lawns is uh, some of our streams are impaired for fecal coliform bacteria which comes from um, uh, pet waste and animal waste and stuff like that. So if you've got a dog in your yard, that's a big uh, source of pollutants um, running off into the stream too. So that's another potential pollutant that you might be able to intercept in a, any situation like yours. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you put a rain garden on That's a good question. Um, it, it probably would, and uh, there's. What is the question? Uh, the question was, uh, if you have a, a rain garden in a large parking lot type of situation, would there be a measurable 
pollutant load in the sediment of the rain garden after years and there probably would be uh, after a certain extent I don't know how much the load it would depend on the loading how much that parking lot gets used you know the type of vehicles that stay there how much it gets sanded in the winter and how well it's swept those type of things but I would think that eventually you would see a measurable effect and we are we're doing more research on um, the maintenance of rain gardens themselves and kind of the uh, life expectancy of a rain garden. Eventually, if you've got a large sediment load, eventually your your infiltration capacity, even of a well-designed rain garden, you're gonna start filling in that pore space, especially your top layers with that fine grain sediment. So you're kind of choking off the infiltration capacity of your existing garden. So um, you will need to probably take off those first couple of layers. And that's another good reason to use uh, um, couple inches of mulch on top because a lot of that fine grain sediment will will uh, accumulate in the mulch and you're going to want to replace your mulch every year or every two years anyway so if you've got mulch in there you can trap a lot of that stuff before it actually starts filling up the pore space in the soil itself what's that uh, I would think you do that typically in the spring before you did any uh, new replanting I I would put my mulch in, new mulch in the spring, I think. I'm fairly new to the gardening thing, though. I just had my first raised bed last year and didn't know what I was doing and planted my carrots too close together and everything, so I'm trying to do better this year. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Can you show that slide of the recommended plants one more time? Sure. And on the website is a list of recommended plants as well. This is the wildflower one. And then there's also the native, one. this one here. A lot of people like the red tree twig dogwood. It's really pretty, um, but the moose love it as well. So if you plant those in your yard, I would definitely recommend some sort of moose measure for the first couple of years, some chicken wire fencing or something like that, because just visited a couple of the gardens this spring that planted some nice big red twig dogwood bushes and uh, they got eaten down to nothing. So. Where do you get the moose garden? What's that? Where can you buy a good moose garden? Oh, I think any of your, your um, home improvement or, uh, you know, um, your uh, Home Depot or uh, Lowe's or AIH or something like that would have chicken wire or some sort of other moose guard. Or, or there's, and there's, a, you know, there's chemical moose guards you can use too. Uh, Alaska Mill and Feed, places like that would uh, know of some products that, that work for that type of thing. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And yeah, and you look in potential reclamation type of effort or something like that. I would doubt that the amount of oil staining and stuff that you get in the runoff that would come from a typical park parking lot would accumulate to the level of, you know, some sort of environmental cleanup type of thing. Um, you know, it's definitely not like an injection well or anything like we have for, you know, a lot worse situations existing in a lot of places in the state than what you would, I think, come on would come off of a typical parking lot surface, but your, 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 your concepts are correct that, yeah, that would, that would happen, and there potentially could be a situation where that could accumulate to a degree that would be concerning, but I would not think that would be very typical. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not likely to get a lot of help from the city to build a garden. Um, I'm the only one that uh, that actually works with rain gardens for the, with the city right now, and uh, that huh? <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
it's, I mean, if, it, if it's a, if it's state property, it would be, and, and it, like you said, if it's a road that was never constructed, that would be considered right of way property. Um, and if you wanted to do something in that area, I would get in touch with the right of way department and find out what they require and what they, you know, what level of uh, uh, work you can do in that area. Because technically it is not your property, so you don't really have the legal right to do anything with it. But like I said, we, we've had some good luck in the past of people wanting to do some, um, you know, rain guard landscaping right adjacent to the sidewalk in their area. And typically you don't own the, maybe probably the first 10 feet of your front yard because the first 15 feet from the road edge is typically right of way area as well. So technically those areas are also city property as well, but we've had pretty good luck of right of way um, allowing people to build gardens in that type of area, as long as it's not in some place where you would need to do utility maintenance or you don't want to put it someplace where they're going to side cast a lot of snow too because you're going to get a, a, a large um, chloride uh, kind of content coming out of the, the snow and a lot of sediment from side cast snow as well. So right away, city, city right yeah, city right away, yeah. And you can find that the department should be able to be found on the on the uh, muni.gov website, or muni.org, excuse me. Yes? Could you go back one slide? Uh, to the uh, flowers. To the flowers? Oh, okay. Anybody else? All right, well, that's about it for me. Thank you for coming. Thanks for inviting me.